So for the past three years, I have gotten on a plane in April, gone over to Geneva, Switzerland for Watches and Wonders, the largest trade show in the entire industry. This event has now well over 35 brands. I've actually lost count. I was there on the ground for the past five days. I have returned home. So now I wanna share some of the best releases from the show, as well as some of the most controversial releases from the show, and also looking at some pieces that were just crazy out of this world in terms of their high complication, what was being done. So I'm not gonna have enough time to cover everything in this video, but if you want a good snapshot of what we were able to cover with a variety of videos when we were on the ground, as well as different articles, hands-on photography, check out the link in the description to a page where we have all of our coverage of Watches and Wonders this year. Check it out in the description down below. The first brand on this list I wanna mention as being some of the best of the show, in my opinion, partially because you saw these watches for their price and position within a show that was surrounded by all this opulence and over the top flair, to find these watches in this range was pretty cool. And I thought they nailed it with the designs. These are Raymond Wiles Millicene automatic watches. So these started with new dial colors, case sizes right in line with, I think many people are looking for 39 and a half millimeters, reasonable thickness, Salita caliber on the inside, 50 meters of water resistance. I think these are really nice looking watches. They also unveiled, they don't have the price just yet, at least I don't have the price when recording this video, new moon phase version within this Millicene line. Raymond Weil on a roll. This is a brand that not many enthusiasts were considering just a few years ago, but now with the GPHG award under their belt, some new releases here, I think they're heading into a great trajectory here to continue to gain market share and gain more interest within watch enthusiasts and collectors all across the globe. These ones stood out to me. So similar to Raymond Weil, right across the hall was another independent brand that also was having their first showing at Watches and Wonders, and they did it with a splash, and a splash of color at that with Nomos, with releasing their Tangente dates. So if you did not see this, you probably didn't follow the event that much because it was talked about quite a bit, and rightfully so. Nomos decided to release 31 of the same style watch, the Tangente date, but doing it with 31 different colorways all with different naming conventions that were more playful. Some of them were in straight German that I couldn't even have any chance of pronouncing. But on further beyond that though, the pricing was around four, three, four hundred dollars cheaper than the conventional Tangente, and that made them that much more compelling. They're limited to 175 pieces per different colorway. 37 and a half millimeter case is really the case size here. They do usually measure it out to 38, but it wears a little bit smaller. Thickness, 6.8 millimeters. And then inside a manufactured caliber movement, this is their DUW4101. This is a movement that they are producing in-house in, in Glasuta, also producing many of the small parts in that facility as well. If you've not seen my video visiting Nomos Glasuta, I'd highly recommend it. I guarantee it will increase the appreciation you have for this brand, but just over $2,000, this was a cool way to get attention, but also producing a product that was a way to be a marketing engine for making a splash at the show, but further getting a watch that I think from a collector standpoint was unique. So if there was one brand that probably had the best pulse on what watch collectors and enthusiasts wanted, and even for myself, like my people, like that's what I'm talking about, even myself, I loved what Tudor was doing. I think they released two watches that answered two common ass of the brand. One, looking first at the Tudor Black Bay 58 GMT. Since 2018, when the Tudor Black Bay 58 came out, but you also had the Tudor Black Bay GMT coming out right in alignment with that watch. And when you saw both of them being unveiled, everybody loved the GMT, everybody loved the Black Bay 58, but one of the criticisms with the GMT was just its thickness and size. Many people wanted a 58 treatment on a GMT. We also saw a couple years ago with the Black Bay Pro that we could get that, but now here's the catch. The thickness was 14.6 millimeters. How do we get everything that we want? We still want more, we still want more. Tudor answers with the Tudor Black Bay 58 GMT. This is 12.8 millimeters in thickness, roughly two millimeters thinner than the Black Bay Pro with a 39 millimeter case. Lot to like on that front, but also a master chronometer movement on the inside, METAS certified, 15,000 Gauss, also testing up the entire case in the process while getting COSC certified movement, so double testing here, 200 meters of water resistance. It nailed it across the board. I think the only criticism of these watches were some people were not as crazy about the gilt markings, but beyond that, it was pretty hard to knock what this release was. Many people were also speculating that the Coke bezel would come from Rolex. I have not even wasted my time doing any predictions anymore just because never correct, it's impossible to predict what Rolex is going to do. They keep everything so tight and secure. They never let anything leak for the most part. But seeing a Coke bezel came from the other Rolex organization brand with Tudor, 
and I think it was well received. This was one of the watches I think really stirred up some conversation on day one. In addition to that though, Tudor Black Bay Monochrome. Now this is a watch that, look, just say it out loud. It's a Tudor Black Bay with no secondary colors, singular black, white contrast. Why is this noteworthy? And I struggled to think about why was I excited about this? And I understand why many people are like, bro, it, it's a black wash, white contrast. I mean, we've seen this so many times, but I think the reason why people are excited is one is it extends off of what we saw last year with the 41 millimeter case Metas certified watches from the Black Bay collection with that burgundy, which if you've never worn those watches before and you think that that's just gonna wear like a conventional 41 millimeter Black Bay, please do yourself the service of going to try that on because you will be very pleasantly surprised how well this wears. But then beyond that, what was always something people said and year after year, what did they want from Tudor? They wanted a Submariner. I always thought Submariner was dead as soon as the Black Bay started to have success. Tudor does not want to revisit the direct identity of former Tudor, which was very much reliant on Rolex. Now they're their own thing. They can exist as they are with their own legends and icons now with the Black Bay. But how could we get close to the sun without going directly to the sun and blowing up as we approach on contact? That is with the Tudor Black Bay Monochrome. It allows you to dance into the lane of the Submariner, get some of that DNA, get the master chronometer associated with it, new wearable case, couple bracelet options, strap options. It delivers on many fronts. And as somebody that loved the 80s and 90s Tudor Submariner models, this is about as close as you're going to get to an example like that in a modern package. Another brand that I'll mention here is Bauman Mercier. One that caught my eye is the Clifton Moon Phase. This is 39 millimeters, good size, Bombatic caliber on the inside, 120 hours of power reserve, moon phase watch, under $5,000. We talked about Raymond Wilde being on this nice little track here of improvement. I think the same thing could be said for Bauman Mercier. I think the Riviera has been a good project for the brand. They did it at the right time. The Bombatic caliber allows them to differentiate from much of the competition. There are really not that many watches in general with five days of power reserve. So to find it at this $5,000 and under price range really allows them to lead this class in terms of that specification for the money. A watch that I was very excited about last year was on my best of list was the Tag Heuer Carrera glass box. I love the sizing of this piece. I love how it returned to form of some of the old Carrera models without being so on the nose. It was recreated with some touches of the past while also thinking about the future. We've seen a lot of the re-editions from the Carrera line to see something that takes a bit of that DNA, but also reinvents it to a small extent where Hoyer fans of the past will like it, but also new fans of Tag Hoyer can also maybe have some fun. That was the great middle ground of that piece. But this year we have a new version of that that personally is my favorite that we've seen. And that might even include the skipper model that we saw from last year. This is the Tag Heuer Career Glass Box with this Panda configuration. We have some touches of more vibrant color throughout, still getting 100 meters of water resistance, 39 millimeter case, automatic caliber on the inside. This is the TH2000, 80 hours of power reserve. Love the way that this one looks. I mean, take a look at this photo on the wrist. I mean, this thing looks like a million bucks. Tag knocked out of the park with this release. So this next watch here, I could see some people pushing back on me and saying that this shouldn't be in the best of series. This should maybe not be considered at all. They shouldn't even be making watches, but I think it was pretty cool. The Hermes Cut. This is a watch that probably is positioned more for women, but if you see it on the wrist, I think this absolutely looks amazing on wrist. I mean, look at this, 36 millimeters. Yes, it's a little bit smaller, but you have the unconventional crown position, the radial numerals on the outside. This is done with so much class. And you look at other luxury brands that have tried to delve into watches, it just doesn't feel right. It just feels off. There's something that doesn't fit. It feels forced. It feels like it's coming from the top uh, executive team to just say, make some watches. I don't care what they look like. We need to hit our numbers. This doesn't feel the same way. I think Hermes in terms of their design is so on it. And last year, I love what they've done with like the H08 and the Mono Pusher and what's been going on in the last couple of years with the brand. They've also ascended in terms of just their ability to stand out from the crowd when it comes to Swiss watchmaking, which these are Swiss made watches, even though the brand is not Swiss. Now in the Morgan Stanley and Lux Consult report, they're easily in the top 20 brands in turnover every single year. So they have been gaining market share. This also comes with 100 meters of water resistance. I love the numeral set, sporty upside, very classy. You have two-tone options, and you also have some other options with diamonds on it, but I'm just talking about more of the conventional stainless steel, the two-tone, and I know that's not gonna be on the list of enthusiasts, 
but also when you're in the mix of this whole event, you're surrounded by watches, you're looking for things that can separate and are maybe doing things that catch you off guard. Hermes has continued to catch me off guard. Maybe that speaks to what my expectation was from their watchmaking based on previous attempts by other luxury brands, but this is a good attempt. And I think it's another example of them probably showing why they've been able to gain market share. So when we think of Zenith, what do we typically think of? We think of El Primero all the time, chronographs. That's what they're known for. Also the Defy is a legend within their collection, but when we think about the Defy, typically it's not a dive watch Defy. This year we got it though, a dive watch from Zenith. We actually have some of the extreme models, but what I was more interested in was the revival piece. This is the 3648. I saw this in person and there's a lot of things that were compelling to me. One is 37 millimeter case, not many different dive watches with that case size in this price range between five to $10,000, which this one is basically right in the middle of that range. Then you have 600 meters of water resistance. You look at this watch and you're probably thinking, okay, 200 meters on a good day, try 600 meters. Then also the sided edges of the case, how it is structured, so unique. The orange on this is so vibrant with the minute track, the bezel, the hands. This watch felt so three-dimensional when I looked at it just because of how orange it was. The contrast was so heavy and unconventional compared to what we've typically seen from Zenith, which in many ways has been seen as the El Primero brand, but I think demonstrates that it can be much more. So a brand that I always love discussing when I go to Watches and Wonders, investigating further is Grand Seiko. I'm a collector of the brand, love what they're doing, and this was the watch that stood out the most, at least from standard production. There were some limited edition models that were very cool, but those are gonna be gone very soon, so you can't get as excited about those because you'll have to live without them for the rest of your life, which is a bummer. But this one is one in standard production and marks a new movement for the brand. This is the Grand Seiko SLGW003. This is a new white birch model changing the orientation of the dial, horizontal display, more of the bark texture, but that is not the main reason why I'm talking about this watch. The main reason is a new caliber, the 9S A4. So this builds off of the infrastructure that came with the 9S A5, but they are redesigning this movement quite substantially. If you look at this and a 9S A5, you are going to be thinking, okay, this is similar in some ways, but very different in other ways. So the first time in 50 years that Grand Seiko has released a manual winding, high beat movement. Pretty hard to believe. In addition, you get brilliant hard titanium. This is the material with higher corrosion resistance, very lightweight, combined with the smaller case size here, it wears like a dream. Also is going to have a lot of possibility with Zeratsu polishing. This looks like stainless steel in person. So I could talk about all the details of this movement, but one area that I would talk about the most is going to be the click on this watch. It's designed like a bird and the click is used in tandem with the ratchet wheel to be able to wind the watch when you engage the crown, inside being that mainspring within a barrel to make sure it's fully wound. What's very cool about this one is a click is typically on a fixated point and will hinge back and forth. This one is on a slide, so it moves in a direction and it's designed like a bird. It also makes this beautiful noise when you wind this watch. Mechanically, this was an entrancing point, but also just from a storytelling standpoint, I thought this was so cool. Next watch I'd mention is JLC with their Duomet collection. I think the Duomet is probably the most underrated watch that JLC makes. I think plenty of attention goes to the Polaris, the Reverso, the Master Collection, but the Duomet is probably the most underappreciated from the entire line, given what it is delivering on a mechanical standpoint. So there was updates to basically the entire range of the Duomet we saw multi-axis tourbillons, we saw chronographs, but even the conventional stainless steel, and I use that word conventional just for lack of a better term because there's nothing truly conventional about this watch. If you're unfamiliar with the Duomet, it basically has two different gear trains, one for the conventional time telling and the other for the complications so that everything can be of the utmost chronometric performance. The stainless steel option starts in the $40,000 range, so still very aspirational, but the movement on the inside feasts for the eyes. You get a variety of different uh, displays here. You have two power reserve indicators on opposite opposing sides on the dial, giving you a sense of how much energy is in each one of those mainsprings, a sixth of a second, moon phase indication, just beautiful looking watches. And when I was going into JLC, they just have been able to nail it year after year after year. I've always been a big fan of what they've been doing and they never disappoint at these shows. Another brand that has been very busy in releasing some cool watches at these shows is Cartier. This year, one that caught my eye is the Santos Dumont Rewind. So based on the name, it is exactly what you might expect. Santos Dumont, looking back to the early 20th century of Alberto Santos Dumont, 
Cartier Santos design, helped establish a legend in a variety of ways. And then you have the sense of rewind. What does that mean? The watch is going to operate in reverse. So they have inverted rotation to match the opposite direction of those Roman numerals on that red lacquer dial. Looks beautiful. This is limited to 200 pieces but I like the eccentric flair, the unconventional flair that comes with this classic looking watch. So what really leads the discussion every single year at Watches and Wonders is what is Rolex going to do? That's always in the lead up. That's also after day one, what people talk about is what people want to discuss, whether good or bad, it creates discourse and discussion. This year, Rolex was, it seemed to be very different than what many people expected. You had one stainless steel option, you had the GMT Master II, the black and gray bezel version, but then you also had this watch. These seem to be the two favorites, and I would almost argue that this seemed to be collectively the one that people liked the most. This also stood out to me as well, because this is not taking the path typically traveled by Rolex, this is the Rolex 1908. We saw the release of this last year, but this takes it a step up to a different notch with this ice blue dial. But why this ice blue dial was important to me is because of the guilloche pattern. This is not something we typically associate with Rolex, and this is real Rose engine work. Thinking about Rolex's typical product, this is not something that they are going to go for. It's more of an industrialized product. It's a well done product, no question about it. There's a reason why they are the king in many ways, but this isn't the type of elements of watchmaking that we will associate with the brand or something that they'll even bother to do. So them to actually roll something out like this and also look the part, I mean, this blue dial with that pattern, it's a beautiful watch, no question about it. I mean, if it had a different name on the dial, we wouldn't be questioning it at all, whether it was a fit or not. It's just that with many people with Rolex, associated with sports watches. To go further, platinum case, 7140 movement on the inside, plus or minus two seconds a day of inaccuracy, 66 hour power reserve. And probably if I have to now reflect on the new Rolex releases, probably my favorite from the entire show from them. So now we move up to this next tier of watchmaking, just some of these more aspirational, types of pieces where brands were almost just flexing how horologically capable they were beyond actually thinking about the end consumer. First watch I'll mention is the Langa Datagraph Perpetual Lumen, something that has been in the collection for well over a decade. This takes the Langa Saxonia Datagraph Perpetual as the lumen, 41 and a half millimeters with case size, L952.4 movement on the inside. You're getting a flyback chronograph, perpetual, outsized date, one minute tourbillon with stop seconds, honey gold case, limited to 50 pieces, fees for the eyes for that caliber, 684 components, 50 hour power reserve, stunning, beautiful watch, both with the lights on and with the lights off. The other watch that was a talk of the show, and I was talking with some of my team members and we were you know, discussing what were some of the standouts. This was one of the pieces that was brought up quite a bit. This is the IWC Eternal Calendar. On the surface, Portuguese collection updated. I think they did a nice job, but this was the standout for sure. Now I'm only gonna be scratching the surface about how this watch actually works. And I am not going to get into it all right now because it would take probably a full thesis to go through this thing. My colleague Mark has written a nice in-depth article about this watch if you do find yourself interested in it. So this watch is known as the Eternal Calendar. And what it's been able to do, perpetual calendar, that will be precise for 400 years without correction. Most perpetual calendars will run on a cycle where at 2100, they'll have to be reset. What they were able to do was add an additional gear this 400 year gear to allow it to be able to span the variety of time to not have the same level of manual interventions needed as a typical perpetual calendar. But they also have a moon phase indication on this watch and we'll have the different phases of the moon that can be tracked for astonishing 45 million years. Yes, you heard that right, 45 million years. So to be able to accomplish these things, they had to simulate 22 trillion gear combinations with the help of a computer to ensure the end result was to their desired effect. Crazy watch, if you wanna learn more, check out the link in the description below. So now this next watch is a watch that is a build off of what we saw two years ago from Grand Seiko with the Kodo. This is known as the Daybreak. This is a new version, more of these frosted bridges, but same concept. And the Kodo was the first watch ever and still remains the only watch ever to have a tourbillon and a constant force mechanism on one axis. Why do you do that? Constant force, gradual distribution of energy. We see this with remontoirs, there's a fusée and chain. What this is going to allow is a gradual releasing of torque 
from the mainspring as you want to make sure that amplitude and the timekeeping is going to remain the same. When a mainspring is fully coiled up, it's going to have the highest torque. As it unwinds, that energy distribution throughout might not be as constant as you want. With this, this allows you to go past that. So having that efficiency with a tourbillon, never been done before, crazy wash to get lost in. But also with the design of this movement, Mr. Kawachia, who was formerly a musician, had a little secret in here. So what you'll hear is the constant force will strike right at the perfect time with the beating of the movement, which is a 28,800 vibration per hour, four hertz movement, something you typically don't see with a constant force or a tourbillon. So it sounds like a 16th note and nice little detail to the designer of the movement. And then two other watches I'll mention in the this crazy tier, that's what I'll call it formally now, the crazy tier. Piaget with the Altiplano Concept Tourbillon. We saw the Altiplano Concept as being the thinnest watch when it was first unveiled. It did lose the title, but Piaget didn't want to sit around this year for an anniversary and just not do anything crazy. They released a Piaget Altiplano Concept Tourbillon. So this is officially the thinnest tourbillon ever produced. The entire case is two millimeters thick. Unbelievable. So this is the manual wound 970PUC. I think one point to call attention to is the base plate of this movement also serves as part of the case structure. There could not be any loss verticality with this case if they wanted to hit this record. Unbelievable to look at. And then the final watch that we'll mention here is Vacheron Constantin's Berkeley Grand Complication. This was a watch that was shown at the front of their booth. It was a watch that we talked about with Christian Salmoni in a video from last week, and it is unbelievable. It's actually the most complicated watch ever made. 11 years of development among three of the best watchmakers from the company then the end result is this. This stemmed from a request from one of their clients, W.R. Berkeley, and the end result is 63 complications, 2,877 components. It weighs over two pounds or 960 grams. It has a perpetual calendar, Chinese perpetual calendar, split seconds chronograph, alarm functions, sonore. There is so much going on in this watch. I could go ahead and probably have a two minute video just listing off the complications that are in this. This is way above my pay grade and to see it in person was incredible. So that was the good from the show. Now let's talk about some of the controversial. What were some of the things people were talking about and were these contested releases, maybe the most hated, maybe they just stirred up the most conversation and people were on the fence about. The first one that springs to mind is the Rolex Deep Sea. This was a watch that on as an object, I thought it was pretty cool looking. I've always been a fan of the bluesy. I've liked the blue and gold combination, but this probably was a little much for most people. And it was pretty funny. You have an 18 karat gold, case outside of a titanium case back and then some titanium with the helium escape valve. Uh, but this is full gold. And then you have 3,900 meters of water resistance to go along with it. First thing I think of when I'm trying to go down that deep is probably need a little bit of gold to you know go flash around. So this was uh, you know, a fun little talking point throughout the week. It's also a very thick watch at 17.7 millimeters. Of all the posts that we posted this week, people were ruthless about this watch. And it was kind of funny. And I understand like Rolex this year was probably looking for less commercial products. My thought was that they are probably trying to make sure their production can go to stainless steel options and they don't want to flood more pieces where it's going to be hard to keep up with the demand. That's just a speculation. I have no idea if that's true, but that was just my thought. So seeing all these precious metal, more out there pieces seem to be part of the strategy. This was one of the comments though, eviscerated. I saw comments saying that this was an Invicta, uh, Invicta homage, uh, that this could be used as the a boat anchor if you ever did take it out to sea. I mean, people were going at this thing. But in practice, probably on the wrist, I have not tried it on the wrist. I could imagine it is going to be a huge, huge watch. But all the animosity that people may have had for the Rolex releases this year, it seemed like it was all directed towards this watch. So I feel for you, Deep Sea. I feel for you, Little Deep Sea. Actually, I shouldn't say little. It's not little, but I do feel for it. So another watch that I mentioned from the Rolex Tudor organization comes from Tudor. This is the Tudor Black Bay 58 Gold. I saw a lot of people talking about this piece, and I even think to myself, like, who is this watch for? I don't know what Tudor client is spending $32,100 on this watch. But I think the only reason why this watch exists is because they want to position and set a market for what the brand is capable of. We mentioned all of these horologically capable pieces that are out of this world from IWC, Vacheron Constantin, Piaget. The whole point for that is not to sell product. It is to show what a manufacturer is capable of. In this case, it's showing that Tudor 
is capable of positioning products at a higher price tier. It's all part of the strategy of the brand, but I can understand as you look at Tudor, so much of what they were doing this year was for the end consumer, commercial product, the monochrome, Black Bay 58, GMT. And these watches are going to be home runs for them. And then you have this, which gold bracelet, gold case, not something we typically associate with Tudor, but I think it demonstrates what they're going to do. And I think it demonstrates that this is going to try to lift up some of the other products. But this was one for many people like, why? Why do you do this? And I think that's the only reason why you do this. I don't know who it's for, but I don't think it was a commercial product to begin with, but a lot of discussion about this one too. So this is a brand that I have not spent a lot of time talking about. And if you are interested in me doing more of a deep dive, I absolutely can. But one brand that was really a controversial one this year was because of some of the changes that they had was Bermont. So Bermont, UK brand, making some pretty cool design watches, but this year they unveiled some new designs and also some new pricing and positioning with their Terra Nova collection, updating their Supermarine, and then updating a new logo. Now, I am not somebody that is an expert on Vermont. There are many other brands that I know much, 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 much more than this brand. So I am coming in with more of a neutral point of view when I saw these watches and they didn't necessarily rub me the wrong way, but I could see where many people that love this brand feel like this is a step backwards for some of their designs. The new logo change always seems to be drawing for many people because people connect with a logo. We see this all the time with many different brands. There's no question, Vermont has a very passionate following. People in the UK, I think, like the connection, the story. And further, they're one of the few success stories in the past 25 years of watchmaking where they've really scaled to a substantial degree. I mean, they're a real brand producing very solid production and output of pieces in a very short period of time. But it seemed like a lot of the products here are more commercially viable to mass market appeal rather than thinking about their core base. And it seemed like many of their collectors were upset. And then one other watch that I would mention here is a watch that I saw the price of it and I heard it in passing and I didn't really think much of it, but then I thought about it and I'm like, whoa, that, that's, that's very aspirational. This is Tag Heuer's Monaco Split Second. Again, we've talked about the theme here, brands showing what they're capable of at a higher tier. Uh, but this watch, split second, I've always heard from watchmakers that a split second Rattrapont, that is one of the most difficult complications to produce as a watchmaker. They developed this with Voshe, within the Monaco, split seconds, makes sense. It's authentic to their heritage, a split second chronograph. If you're going to do a high complication, this is one that can make sense. But the watch costs $138,000 and that's where I think there needs to be a discussion because that is very aspirational. You think about what else is available for that price range, and then it starts to really become this question of, okay, you know, who is this for? What's the point? These are the type of questions that come out. And if you look at LVMH, you see what they're doing with many of their brands. This is an important idea to what's going forward. But it doesn't mean that $138,000 watch is going to jive with everybody uh, from Tag Heuer. But all right guys, that is my recap of Watches and Wonders this year. I did not have an opportunity to see everything. I try to see as much as I can, but four days at a show, five days at a show, it's really not enough. For the amount of brands that are there, the amount of time that you need to spend, the amount of watches that are in front of you, it is a crazy amount. So this is just my download, really what I was able to see in person and also just kind of covering the event, being in the, the halls, walking around. Uh, but did you follow the event? Did you get a chance to actually go to the event? What did you like? What did you not like? Also, what were your favorite watches from the show, best in show, as well as some of the watches that you weren't as much of a fan of? Leave those comments down below. Also, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell icon. Really do appreciate that. Also check out teddybaldasar.com, full authorized dealer of 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I'll see you all very soon.